when we are talking to someone, the most important thing is we want them to take away some information with them. We want our talk to be well received. We can't just think what I want to say. We have to think about the other side. How are they going to receive it? Hello, hello! Welcome back to the Conductors Podcast Summer Mini Series. In today's episode, I'll be talking about the topic of speaking to the audience. Again, you probably realize that for this month, I'll be talking about things that I learned after I started working professionally as a conductor that I didn't one get a lot of training during my student years. And two that I found are more and more important, or that I realized much later in my career is something that is actually really, really significant, or something that I had to work hard on. Speaking to the audience is something that is now more popular, even with professional ensembles. I remember more than ten years ago when I was doing my masters at CCM, Pavel Yarvi was still the conductor of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. It was the beginning of the trend of musicians speaking to the audience before the performance started. But people say I've never met Pavel myself. We had a master class scheduled、um, for him to visit the school, but. It was when you know when the Iceland volcanic eruption happened, so he was trapped in Europe and couldn't come. But anyways, so people told me that Pavel was so so shy that he didn't like speaking to the audience directly. So they started filming a short video of him speaking to the audience, and they would play that video at the beginning of the concert. It's usually pretty short, two or three minutes of him just kind of introducing. The pieces that he selected, his programming ideas behind those repertoire, and something like just to make the conductor a little more personable. And then they started to adding introductions from different musicians in the ensemble, which is also nice because you know when you go to a a symphony orchestra concert, you are only seeing the ensemble as a whole. You don't get to really know the individual players. So they will have the principal oboe、um, talk about one piece, have the principal bass talking about the other, something like that. But it was pre-recorded, and I understand that because not every conductor is comfortable speaking to the audience right before they have to conduct, which is a skill that is emphasized much more lately. Now we want the conductors to be very personable, very approachable, very accessible to the patrons. And recently, with a lot of the assistant conductor job opens, of it has become sometimes part of the application requirement. We have to record something as a pre-concert talk, or like just like an example of public speaking for the selection committee during the two. Residency weekends with girls who conduct and the Georgia Symphony Joint Fellowship Program. We did two workshops on how to speak to the audience, and then I had some findings and, of course, from my own experience that I wanted to share with you. Before we started, I wanted to recommend a really nice reading written by my friend Michelle Merrill. She was the former. Associate conductor with the Detroit Symphony and had done a lot of performances with the Detroit Symphony, where she had to speak to the audience. And I will link that in the show notes for sure. But if you wanna just search, is it's an article that she wrote for Everything Conducting, and she talked in details about how she prepares for you know educational concert. For family concert, for pops concert, for you know July Fourth patriotic performance, and for other things, that's a really nice read, and I would recommend you check it out. And she is also such a wonderful musician and friend. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about something that is different. But before we get started, I wanted to talk about some of the terms since、um, I had people asking me about it. Pre-concert talk is something that is a little more formal sometimes. It usually happens an hour or so before the performance starts, and it can be done by the assistant conductor 
or for big organizations, you know, like Chicago Symphony, they will hire someone to do a pre-concert talk. So say eight o'clock performance, it might happen at seven o'clock, usually lasting for about thirty minutes, and then you have another thirty minutes to get prepared. To, you know, you can get a drink, use the restrooms, and get ready for the concert. It's usually free of charge, and depending on the organization, that can be more informational. Like the ones I have attended at the Chicago Symphony, they had the musicologist to talk about the backgrounds and the musical ideas of the pieces, and sometimes it's very serious and formal. They are ones that being conducted by the assistant conductor that can be a little more on the practical side. You never know, so it depends. There is another term that is a lecture recital, and usually, if it's a lecture recital type of talk, you will explain each piece right before the piece. So you'll be talking throughout the performance, like a lecture. This has become a little more popular now, or it can be very easily seen, like almost like a Educational concert with an orchestra. If you've been to those kitty concerts, you know they talk a little bit between several pieces, or they might even do a demonstration. I've done those ones a few times. One time I had to do it because my soloist, who was scheduled to arrive that morning of the performance, had a delayed flight. There was a huge snowstorm in New York where he was flying from. So by the time when we started the concert, four p.m., he was still not there yet. But we had to start the concert. The audience arrived, and then started introducing it. And so I had to talk before each piece, just to buy time for my soloist to get to the performance. So I was talking and talking, and so I had to share my ideas of picking these pieces, a little bit background about the piece, and a little bit about the composer. And until when I saw. The solo is rush into the concert hall. Then I know, okay, okay, now I can stop talking. So that's just like a a fun experience that happened earlier this year. So that's sometimes called a lecture recital if you are more serious about you know the facts of the musicologist side of information. That can be a lecture recital. Aside from that, a lot of times my friends who are taking the position of as a principal. Conductor or as the music director of the organization of the ensemble will at least greet the audience once from the podium. It could be at the beginning of the performance, or、uh, what I usually like to do is to do it right before the piece with the largest instrumentation, so when everyone is on stage. But I usually speak once and once only at each performance, just to. You know, have a nice connection and thank the patrons and thank the parents if it's an educational concert and just talk to the people. I think people are now liking it. People like to not only hear the music but also understand a little more about you as a musician and your organization. So that's a really nice way of connecting. Now, as I said, Michelle wrote details description about. How you should say things, what you should say with each types of concerts, and even if you're not an orchestral conductor, I think the principles that she talks about can also apply to you know to a choral conductor, to a band, wind ensemble concerts, and everything. Because what she was sharing is really good. What I wanted to talk about today is actually more on the practical side. You know, as conductors, how can we Get better. I think that's a common theme that's been shared on my podcast and also with girls who are not because we are always trying to improve ourselves. So, from the two workshops that we did with our conducting fellows, I learned a few things. First of all, you really need to determine a few parameters, a few aspects of your talk. You want to know who is your audience. That sounds obvious, right? But not a lot of people really think about that. Are you talking to kids? Is it educational? Do you want them to learn something? Are you talking to patrons or donors who might know a lot about your organization? Or are you talking to newcomers 
who are young people who might not be interested in knowing the histories or theories and you know comparing different versions of Chaik Five that was conducted by Chelly Vidake or Gia Give or some other people. So you really want to know who you are speaking to, and that determines one how long your talk is going to be, and two your tone, and three. The content. See, when we are talking to someone, the most important thing is we want them to take away some information with them. We want our talk to be well received. We can't just think what I want to say. We have to think about the other side. How are they going to receive it? And why am I saying it? Because I learned it in a really hard lesson years ago. I applied for an assistant conductor position with a professional orchestra. And I was not chosen as a finalist, but I got some feedback from the music director, which I was really appreciative. I was so grateful because a lot of times we don't get feedback, right? We don't know why we were not chosen, why we were not shortlisted, and also I was really grateful that when he gave the feedback, it was not just some generalization. He really looked at my material and told me things that he felt I could improve on. And the biggest concern the committee had with me. Was about my pre-concert talk video. He said I was really close to be shortlisted because the conducting was really good. I was among the best conductors who applied, but they had some concerns about my video that I was not exciting to watch. I was first offended and shocked. I have to be honest because I I took a lot of time to record that video sample. I wrote script and I did a lot of research, but then he told me it wasn't so much like for him. It wasn't so much about the not exciting part, but I didn't seem very engaging. That's why he was concerned. He said my voice was really warm and they had good materials and it, like it was really well organized, but especially during the time of COVID, people got so used to. Consuming information online, watching videos, people go to another one after ten seconds if it's not interesting anymore. So if I'm not very engaging and catching people's attention at the very beginning, it's not successful. At least for the purpose of this application material as a、uh, public speaking, you know, like the pre-concert talk sample, which I got. Which I agree, and I was very grateful that he said that. So when I recorded this video example, I modeled it the series "Keeping Score" that was done by Michael Tilson Thomas and the San Francisco Symphony. It's on YouTube. It's available. It's really awesome. They are one-hour documentaries, and Michael Tilson Thomas talk about eight different composers. They went to their hometown and talk about the historical context and background of some of the famous pieces, how they were composed, about the composers. I really loved those videos. I watched them a lot during some of my score studies, and I wanted to be that kind of person. So when I did the application. I modeled it. It was a really nice, warm tone. I started talking about, you know, the historical background, and then related back, which was a huge mistake, because I realized the purpose of keeping score is totally different from my video. As I said, keeping score is a documentary. It's something that is well produced by Michael Tilson Thomas and the San Francisco Symphony. So. It's for someone who has an hour, wanting to learn more or very deep about a piece or a composer, and they are there for educational and informational purposes. A pre-concert talk is not that. It's not a documentary. A pre-concert talk is a short talk, a short speech to prepare your audience going to. A performance. You want to one engage them, two have them excited about what they are going to hear, and three maybe something that they look forward to doing 
the performance, you know, because if you don't know anything about the music, it could be boring or like you could lose track of okay, what should I listen to? Now I'm sitting here for two hours. So the purpose of this kind of talk is totally different, and I missed that point until I got that feedback. So that made me thinking about okay, what is a good pre-concert talk or What can I improve on、um, my public speaking to the audience? Because I've been talking to audience a lot, like for years. I speak every single time when I have a concert, but I never really think deeply about that. About what is the purpose? What are the goals that I want to achieve? So what I found through these workshops that we did with the fellows are one: we very often. Want to include too many points. There are too many facts, too many important statement, and it's easy to get lost when you are just listening to it. So I encourage people to always look back to their purpose. Who is your audience? And two, what is the one thing that you want them to remember? They probably won't remember a lot of the things that you said, but what is the one thing that's so important that you want them to remember? And then plan it around it. And the next is by giving them this one thing to remember. You want to approach it through the things that your audience can relate to. We all have heard of the saying, you know, people remember how they feel, not exactly what the words that you say. Okay, I'm paraphrasing, but we understand. People remember how they feel about an experience and to connect to people's. Emotional feeling, you do it through relatable stories. You want to tell a story. You don't want to burn them with fact, right? So I'm going to give you an example. The pre-concert talk that I mentioned that kind of really failed me from the job application years ago was on Symphony Fantastic by Berlioz, and I said I modeled it on Michael Tilson、um, Thomas. Documentary, so I started talking about the background. I I remember I, I started the script with the French Revolution, which was another mistake, you know, because that's something that's so far from my audience or from whoever that will be watching the video. A pre-concert talk serves a few purposes. First, it's something really quick before the performance starts. So your number one goal is to engage your audience. Number two, you want to make the audience excited about what they are going to hear, right? So you want to engage them, make them excited, and look forward to the upcoming performances. You can tell them a little bit about the performers, about the ensemble, about something that's fun that happened during the rehearsal week. But give them something to look forward to while you engage them. And number three. That's what I like to add a little into. Whenever I talk to the audience, I want to give them a little information about what they can listen for, because not all audiences are well familiar with the music that you're going to perform. And also, when you're going to a performance of you know two hours, sometimes it can get a little boring or less engaging if they don't know the music well. They might get bored not knowing what to do. So I will give them one or two things and like. Hey, you know, in the middle of the piece, pay attention to the trumpet when they scream up really high. That symbolizes the cry from the prince. Or there's something that's really unique about the ensemble that we practiced for many, many times because it's something really challenging. Or when you hear the concertmaster solo, um, concertmaster, which is the principal first violinist, and that melody symbolizes. The princess, and it's a duet between the princess and the hero, or something like that, that helps them to have something that they can listen more carefully to. So that's something that I learned later on, after I I was given that feedback about my pre-concert talk video. That's what I realized that the purposes of a pre-concert talk. Now you can probably imagine that since this feedback and also. Because of the workshops that I led with the fellows, I started to pay much more attention to myself whenever I speak to the audience, from the podium or you know 
no matter it's pre-concert or sometimes it's during intermission or after the concert or I was speaking from the podium, I want to see how I can be more effective. A little bit like when we talk about rehearsal, right? We want to be not just repeating our mistakes. We want to get better each time. And during the pandemic, it was such a blessing that a lot of the resources and, you know, the self-motivation, self-improvement things that were available online for free or for very little um, money. And I actually found marketing skills really helped me. It sounds weird, right? But I first started learning about marketing because of my friend Tiffany Chan's encouragement. And if you don't know Tiffany, she is a good friend and also my guest in episode number four, when she talked about managing your fears and redefine success. And it's also one of the most popular episodes. So episode number four, from fear to courage. But she recommended then she thought it was an important thing, especially in this digital world after pandemic that conductors need to have their works known. So learning how to market and present yourself well in this industry was something useful for us. So I started listening to podcasts, reading articles, and taking some um, courses online. And it was funny that I really found the part of TPO teaching the online marketing or, you know, like the um, creating online courses about creating content or copywriting can be applied to our public speaking. You know, there are those little Instagram or like, you know, mini resources teaching you how to write something that people will not read, right? They will have this fancy title. Do you want your emails answered or opened? How to increase your sign up rate? That kind of thing. But what they are teaching is a very general human behavioral science. You know, we want it to catch people's attention from the very beginning. As the music director who gave me those feedback said, you know, like they lost me after the first 10 seconds or 15 seconds because I was not very engaging. I wasn't very exciting to listen to. So you wanted to have a hook or something that Encourage people to want to find out more about you, about what you want to tell them or what information you'll be giving them. So you want to hook and then you're going to explain, you're going to tell your story and then you want a lesson for them to take away. For example, if I am giving a pre concert talk to a program that has this piece, say, Carol Binning's Requiem in C minor, which is a lesser known piece for a lot of people. And what does it sound like if I say, the Requiem in C minor for mixed choir choruses was written by Luigi Cherubini in 1816 and premiered on the 21st of January, 1817 at a commemoration service for Louis XIV of France on the 24th anniversary of his beheading during the French Revolution. Ugh, that sounds really dry, right? If I change that to, you know, one piece on today's program, it's so special and really, really well regarded by the composer's contemporaries that it was so famous that it was performed at Beethoven's funeral. See, that's what I meant as a cook, because I say something that's surprising or the kind of lesser known fun fact, but Beethoven was someone a lot of people going to a classical concert would know. That, oh, I had not thought of that. What music was played at Beethoven's funeral? Then you hooked your audience and got their attention. And then when you explain and tell them more about this requiem, it would be much more engaging and they would really want to look forward to. I probably told you that my video example that I submitted to the job application was Berlo Symphony Fantastic. Later, I created a new version for some other job applications, and I started by telling the audience this way. The concert today means a lot to me because one of the pieces that we are performing tonight is actually the piece that changed my life. 
it was because of that particular piece, I decided to become a conductor when I was still a law student studying European law. See, then this is way then people got curious about what I'm going to tell them, and、I、haven't revealed the answer yet. I had I didn't just tell them, hey. I'm so excited about today's performance because we are going to listen to Symphony Fantastic, and that's a piece that actually changed my life because I went to a concert which was awesome, and the orchestra played this piece and made me wanted to be a conductor. You see, it's about good storytelling. You wanna make people interested in what you are going to say, tell them something about it, and then give them an answer at the very end. With some lesson, if you want or moral that you want them to take away, so this is something kind of easily said <laughs> than done, like everything in our business. And what I want to encourage you is to practice, practice, and practice. And the best practice I actually found was to have a group of people to practice it together, because one, when you read something out loud, it feels totally different from just writing a script. Two. After you read it, people will have a chance to give you feedback. You know, sometimes when in writing it sounds very fluent, but it might be too detailed for the audience, or the way you deliver the speech, you might speak too fast, or there might be too many facts too close together that we miss the point. Just like the first example I gave, you know, like the requiem in C minor for mixed tenth chorus. That was a terrible one. I was reading the Wikipedia out loud, but I could have changed that into something that was very different, you know. Or I could have say, you probably heard of Louis the Fourteenth of France, who was beheaded during the French Revolution, and this piece we are performing tonight was so special that it was premiered as the commemoration service of the twenty fourth anniversary of his beheading, huh? I wonder why would people celebrate the twenty fourth anniversary of a king being killed? So you can lead to you know if you want to talk about the French Revolution or about people the historical background of about peace, that's something that is kind of relatable or more accessible for the audience to think. Oh, if we have a president killed now, do we celebrate the twenty fourth anniversary of John Kennedy being assassinated? No, we don't. We don't do that, right? That's also another way. If you tied it to a news or something that is not as further historical, but something that is closer to people's life, and be really engaging, funny, and don't be afraid to be silly. Make jokes. Jokes are the best. I remember doing one of the workshops、um, with our fellows. The conductor said was talking about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and to close, she said, "When Beethoven premiered the symphony, there was a four-hour-long concert. But don't worry, we are not going to sit here for four hours. The concert will be well ended before you know it." So that was just something cute and、um, to relate to. And by the way, yes, back then they used to have you know sometimes two symphonies premiered together. So Back then, you know, they had ent- no entertainment. There was no internet, no TVs, and all they could do was going to concert, right? So this is a、um, just a little something that I wanted to share with you. I don't always write full script. I'm not a kind of person who write full script, but I do write outlines. I have some bullet points of what I want to do, what I want to talk about, and I organize them. And then I talk and talk and talk again and again. Sometimes record myself. I started using a transcription service because of the podcast. But then when I first saw the transcription, I was shocked because there were so many、mm, um, unvoiced pauses. Or I found out I like to say like a lot. I put like into every other sentence, <laughs> which I'm still working on. But you need to be aware of the problems first. You know, awareness is the first thing that you should have when you want to solve a problem. So here we go, my friends. When we talk about speaking to the audience, no matter what, you want to be engaging. You want to have some interaction if you can. But remember, they will not remember every single details that you are telling them. But they will remember a story. They will remember the emotion that you evoke from them. 
and give them one or two good points to take away with them. No more than that. I hope you're having a great summertime and having a great July. If ever you want me to read over your script or to listen to your practice recording, please feel free to send it to my way. You can always reach me on social media, or you can find me at the Conductors Podcast. One word, no separation at gmail dot com. It's the Conductors Podcast at gmail dot com. And if you haven't done so, please consider to leave a review on Apple Podcast. This will help me to reach out to more audience that will benefit from hearing rambling. <laughs> and also a lot of great conversations with your friends and wonderful musicians. Have a great week! I will see you next week at the same time, same place. Bye for now.